Okay, so welcome to video number seven in microfluidics. So we're gonna start a new section here and we're gonna take a look at transport equations. So up until now, we've done some scaling and dimensional analysis, looking at how we derive the equations, you know, that dictate the physics of our problem so we could figure out velocity profiles of these fluids at small scales. So now we take the next step forward and what we're gonna look at here is how when we have things located in these fluids, things meaning they could be bacteria or microorganisms, they could be food, there's all sorts of things, cells, dye, that we want to have move around within the fluid. And so what we're looking at now is how do these things transport? So these are the transport equations. And we're going to be basically answering some fundamental questions. Like the first one is how do we mix in low Reynolds number? So we saw in some of the papers earlier, right, that at a small enough scale, stirring really isn't effective anymore. And so again, you can imagine yourself being scaled down. We talked about when we scaled somebody down, what that would feel like to them to try to swim around at that scale is it would feel like you're in molten glass or a really thick molasses, right? Like trying to swim around. So we can imagine that it's also complicated to have things transport with this kind of physics as well. So we're gonna take a look here at how that happens. And so we're gonna start with the diffusion equation and we're gonna sort of throughout this lecture, we're gonna think on a molecular scale. And so for diffusion here, just make sure I'm recording on this slide again before I write anything. Um, yeah, so for diffusion, I have a few figures on the left and so if we think about individual molecules shown as these red circles here, if they start off all grouped up together in the top left corner, right, eventually we'll see them spread out. And below that is a, is a little bit more demonstrative figure. So if you have the dye added in the one on the left here, so that's just a drop of dye, right, as we progress through time, so that's what we're seeing with, with each of these arrows here like this, then what happens is it's, it spreads out. And so that's a result of the random vibrations, right? So these molecules are in motion, okay? And it's not just the dye particles that are in motion, right? The water itself is in motion or, or whatever liquid you're in. All these molecules are actually inherently in motion. They have their own vibrations. And so as time progresses, these molecules move around. They're sort of jostled and bumped into each other and they're randomly displaced. That's what we say diffuse. Diffuse is like they're randomly displaced so that a drop of dye spreads in time, right? Like if I spray perfume in like one corner of the room, you're gonna be able to smell it at the other end, right? And so that transport, even if the room is completely still, right? Even if there's no flow of air, you can still have that accomplished just with diffusion, where diffusion refers to just the natural motion of the molecules. So not diffusion is not by like convection or force convection where there's airflow moving the particles around. In diffusion, we're only talking about the molecular effects. The molecules are, are in constant motion. So we, I've said here at the right, the rate of diffusion depends on a few different things, right? The temperature, the pressure. Also a big factor is the concentration difference or the concentration gradient that you have, right? All these things kind of drive uh, the diffusion. And I've put a link to a video down in the caption. It's a simple tutorial video describing Brownian motion. And, and Brownian motion just named after Brown because he first observed this with uh, some pollen. And it, when they were in suspended in a liquid, it looked like they were all kind of jiggling around. It was the first sort of like visualization we had of Brownian motion because of course you're seeing them bump into all the nearby molecules, the water molecules. And so, but you can see the pollen, right? Whereas you can't really see that the water molecules are moving. So it was, you could actually visualize it. Um, and then on the bottom of this slide here, just showing a difference uh, between the random walk. So the one on the left is just a random walk where the bacteria is just moved around. There would be a random walk on the left, but the one on the right there, so the bacteria is actively moving around now, or, or it has some ability to change its direction. So that's called chemotaxis, where there's a positive stimulus, so we can see it's actually progressing downwards. And we talked about that in relation to the Purcell paper, right, where you'd potentially be moving like a grazing animal on a pasture, you'd be moving towards greener pastures. So there might be, the positive stimulus might be there's more food down near the bottom. So it doesn't progress straight there, you still have the random motion, but it's combined with a general progression towards the area with the more positive stimulus. Okay, now I'm gonna get a, a fresh page for this. We're gonna look, start looking at the equations here. So how can we describe this? How can we figure out a way to characterize mathematically this motion? Okay, so we're gonna start by looking at our random walk in one dimension here. So we're gonna look at a straight line with just the uh, x dimension for now. So we're gonna first say we consider particles distributed in a straight line. Remember, the best way to maximize your retention of this information is to be taking your own notes. So write it down yourself. Okay, so let's draw out this straight line. What do we mean by that? Okay, and this is the framework we're, we're gonna use to come up with these equations. So the particles will occupy 
each of these lattice positions here, x equals i times delta x, where the i equals negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, etc. And delta x is some like displacement value. Okay, we're going to let n denote the number of particles at the position x at time t. Okay, and that n represents a number density, right? So we would say like number of particles divided by the volume. That would, would be in 3D, for example. Okay, and we can treat uh, n as a continuous function of x and t if we assume that delta x is small compared to typical displacements that occur over long times. And then, of course, is if n is a continuous function of x and t, we can define our uh, partial derivatives there. Okay, I'll get a fresh page. Make sure I hit record on that page. Alrighty, so now let's talk about um, these particles moving. So we're going to assume that in a time interval delta t, a particle can move left or right. Now we're going to denote the probability that it moves left or right. So we say the probability to move left is p equals a half. The probability to move right, therefore, is 1 minus p also a half. We This is what we call a random walk. When p is not equal to a half, it's called a biased random walk, like what we saw before. And I love the example that's used for this. Uh, so for example, uh, like if you had a drunk stumbling down an inclined sidewalk, right, they would tend um, to just naturally be biased towards walking like down the slope, right? Okay, so we asked the question, how does the number density of particles at any x position change with time? Okay, so let's write out what that looks like then. So at position x, the number density changes over a time delta t by uh, the following equation here. Okay, so delta n, the change in the number density, we say that's equal to the rate of change times the time step. Okay, and then what is that comprised of? So we're going to have particles moving, right? So at position x, where we're located, we're going to have all the particles that jumped left from our neighbor to the right. And then we're going to have all the particles that jumped right from our neighbor to the left. That's everybody coming in to our x position. And then, of course, all the particles that exit, that jump left or right from x, right? We're going to have to subtract off that as well. So that's how we write this in an equation. Okay, I'll get a fresh page here. Okay, so then we can, like we did before, we can use a Taylor series to expand the terms about x. We can see these Taylor series are really handy eh, when we're uh, deriving equations. Okay, so we've seen the Taylor series come up in our previous derivations. Now what we're going to do, same kind of thing. We're going to substitute and we're going to take p equals a half. And we're gonna, so we're going to plug all that in and we get the following where H-O-T means higher order terms. So, of course, the Taylor series expansion keeps going, but we're going to neglect those higher order terms. Okay, so I can fur further simplify this by dividing by delta T, and then I can take that term there, uh, delta X squared over 2 delta T, we can take that to be constant and rewrite it with a constant letter there that, of course, we'll see. We already have an understanding of what that's going to become. Okay, now what we have here, you might even recognize it, right? So that's uh, the 1D diffusion, uh, or it's also known as the heat equation, because heat diffuses as well. And this constant term, right, so our capital D there, that we've defined, that's called the diffusion coefficient, and it has dimensions of length squared over time. Okay, and I'll get a fresh page here. Okay, so we can elaborate a little bit more on our n, our number density term. It's also referred to as a number concentration. And if n refers to density of matter, um, then it's their mass concentration, right? Where units of uh, kilograms per meter cube. And oftentimes we see that concentration denoted by the letter C. So I'll write it that way here. And then we have our complete uh, 1D diffusion equation here. Okay, and then if we non-dimensionalize this, we've seen the power in that. Some reference variables here as usual. We sub those in. Okay, we simplify this, and then as per usual, so the CNOTs cancel, we'll choose our characteristic time. I should have written a subscript C there. Okay, so we can choose, as we've done before, to make that equal to one, we need it to be length squared over D. And we can also look at this another way. We have our diffusion length, where the length changes like root D times our characteristic time. And so we see that 
time and length here are linked. And essentially, uh, we can think of that like as an expanding uh, sphere when we have diffusion. Um, so let's take a look at that. I'm gonna pull up a fresh slide here with a little plot on it to show the behavior of these particles. Okay, and so that shows this like diffusive behavior here, right? So we have that in initial distribution as the peak here, right? And we see that the peak concentration decays, right? As we move forward in time. So it decays down to like this curve here, right? And so what happens is the width of the distribution increases, but the area under the curve remains constant because we have to conserve mass. And then it decays down to this red one here. Okay, and we just make a little note about that. Right, okay, now let's move on to our random walk in three dimensions. Okay, so no need to do that all out again. We've seen the method, right? So it's a similar analysis in 3D, but except P equals one sixth. That's the probability of a particle moving in any of the six neighboring positions. And then we arrive at this following equation here, okay, which we may recognize as the 3D diffusion equation, where D is our constant and C is a function of X, Y, Z, and T. Okay, we'll get a fresh page here to talk about flux now. Okay, so the definition of a flux, right, is the number of particles that cross a given unit area per unit time in a given time interval. Okay, we've probably seen that come up at some point in an earlier course. When I think of it, I most commonly associate it with like heat transfer. We talk about flux a lot in heat transfer. Here, of course, we're talking about the movement of particles and not heat. And we have Fick's law, and Fick's law relates the flux to the concentration, same way we would use a law like Fourier's law. And then Fick's second law is um, predicts how diffusion causes the concentration to change over time, which, as we have seen, we can actually derive uh, right by the conservation laws. Okay, so I mentioned when we started talking about this, right, I really made a point of saying, you know, it's not diffusion when there's flow, right? When there's a net motion of the air. Okay, that's not diffusion. So now let's look at what happens when we do have a flow. Okay, and we're going to look at the advection diffusion equation here. And again, as we've done previously, right, we have some idea that we're going to come up with a parameter that helps us explain this. So let's walk through this. Okay, so we have the unsteady term and the advection term here. And these are all the... Uh, time dependent terms and then we have the diffusion term and we have a source term over here okay now let's look at this in the context of a microfluidic system so i'm going to get a fresh page to do this and sketch out our geometry again and what's going on here use some different colors so we don't all go crazy channel walls and our low profile x and y this is our flow in the x direction this is the height of our channel. Okay, so we recall that our diffusion time scale, the characteristic time we set above was our length squared over D. So let's now non-dimensionalize the advection diffusion equation as follows, and let's see where that takes us. Okay, and we're gonna neglect the source term because the source would just be like a source of, for example, if the molecule was a dye, right? It would just be like a little point source of that dye coming out. So we're gonna neglect the source term in this case and have a look at what happens here. So I sub in as per usual, and I'll simplify, I'll write this all out here, as we've done now many times. Should be getting good at this now. Simplify so we can take care of some of these right off the top here, and rewrite this simplified form. Okay, and now we see, right, what we wanted to find from non-dimensionalizing this. So this right here is what we call the Peckle number, and that's a ratio of the advection effects over the diffusion effects okay where to be super clear right so that's due to flow advection's due to flow and diffusion right due to the random molecular interactions okay so of course again knowing the peckley number 
for a given situation then is going to tell us a lot about the relationship between the advection effects and the diffusion effects. And we'll take a look at that. That's actually, it's really cool to see. I just want to make a quick note here, right? Again, we're working in micro channels. So for the complete picture. So previously, um, we found before that, um, what our velocity profile is. Okay. So we know that, right? When we write an equation like this, and now I'm going to play a few examples here. Okay, so in the first one, it's going to be pure diffusion. Okay, so no advection at all. So I've said, for example, this could be like a drug delivery vehicle. Um, so we'll watch in pure diffusion what happens here as I play this video. Okay, so we have our peak initially, right? And then it widens out. Okay, so initially the peak, we'll play it again. And it just widens out and spreads as it diffuses. Okay, now let's look at an example where the Peclet number is equal to 1. Remember, this is the ratio of advection to diffusion effects. So I'll play that, okay? And we can see a little bit of flow from left to right. So we still have diffusion effects, right? The width is getting wider as the peak goes down. It's moving slightly left to right. Okay, now Peclet number of 10, right? So 10 times the advection effects of the last one over the diffusion effects because it's advection over diffusion. So let's see. So we should see. Let's stop, though. We're expecting to see what? The flow should be more dominant now, right? So try to picture in your head what that's going to look like. I'll play this. Okay, so flows from left to right, right? And we're seeing a more combined effect. So we still have the diffusion, but we also have the advection moving it uh, from left to right. Now, Peckley number of 100, we'll stop and think again. What we're expecting to see now is quite a bit more dominance of this flow, right? So let's take a look at that. Okay. Still have some diffusion effects, but the flow from left to right is quite a bit more dominant, just like we'd expect. So I also have a table here. When we talk about mixing times, we just derive this mixing time. And I think it's really interesting to see what these uh, time scales are, because you can see a real difference in the importance of diffusion in these systems. So if we just had a regular size system, dye in water, a glass of 10 centimeters, our diffusion mixing time, 10 to the 5 seconds. So dye in water in a microsystem, one micron, 10 to the minus three seconds, okay? Because it's so small, right? Diffusion takes care of it so quickly in a system that's only one micron big, right? So now dye in water in a microsystem of 100 microns, that'd be about 10 seconds, okay? And enzymes and proteins in a micro reactor that's about 100 microns, that would take about 1,000 seconds to mix due to diffusion, right? So in our next video, we'll look at some strategies some things people do to enhance the mixing in microchannels, but this really gives us an idea of how, and we saw this in the Purcell paper too, right? How important diffusion becomes at these smaller length scales. So yeah, it's really incredible how quick it is. And so this is why if you at, at a extremely small scales here, you can actually mix with diffusion quite well. So one of the tricks, of course, as you'll see as we go forward, right, is to, if you can squeeze something into a really small, length scale chamber, right? Diffusion can mix it really quickly and then you can flow it back out, say, to a larger chamber, right? So these kinds of things become sort of engineering design um, related uh, understanding we have when we understand these equations. And then I have also listed there, so the assigned reading for video number nine. And this is a really interesting paper here. It's called Making It Stick. That was published in 2008 in Nature Biotechnology. So in video number nine, not the next video, but the one after that, I'll be discussing a few of the interesting points made in this article. And I encourage you to read it on your own before watching that video and forming some of your own ideas about it. There's really some interesting things going on in there. Okay, so just to summarize this lecture here, we are looking now at transport equations, right? So how things move around within our microfluidic systems. And what we started with is we derived out the diffusion equations and talked about how diffusion works. And on the molecular level, right, it's like the spreading due to the random molecular motion. Then we took a look at advection, right, when you have both flow and diffusion, right? And we saw a few examples there in microchannels, how that changes the transport. Some interesting uh, time scales there for mixing in microsystems. Uh, and then that was everything. And that's all for video number seven. Thanks for watching.